Hello, good morning. And this is Monero Yarreal with the Wilma Charitable Foundation. I am the Foundation Program Coordinator. And today we're going to be covering Beyond Burnout, Nurturing Resilience and Caregiving with Lakeland Aikberg. We it is a great presentation and here is her bio. She serves as gerontologist and caregiving advocate for Honor and Home Instead, the world's largest provider of home care. Lakeland began her career in a local home instead working one-on-one -on -one with aging adults. Today, she works to educate professionals, families, and communities on the unique challenges older adults face and the resources available to help them thrive. Lakely earned a PhD in gerontology from the University of Nebraska. She has spoken nationally and internationally to the topic of caregiving and aging and serves as a resource to major media, including Dr. Phil and Dr. Ross. Lakely has a passion for helping others and giving back to her community. And on that, take it away, Lakely. Thank you so much for doing this for us. Thank you so much, Minerva. Hi, everyone. It's great to be with you today. I'm very excited to talk about this topic of, of beyond burnout, nurturing resilience and caregiving. It's so easy uh, for caregivers to get to that point of burnout. Um, and that's something we really want to avoid. And there's things that we can do, hopefully, um, to, to avoid getting to that point. So we're going to be talking about that today. And I'm going to go ahead and share my slides uh, and then go ahead and get started. So I just want to confirm that we can see the slides. Minerva, a thumbs up? Thumbs up. Everything's awesome. good. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so again, I'm, I'm Lakeland Eichenberger, uh, gerontologist and caregiving advocate for Home Instead. Uh, and I love talking about caregiving. Uh, I, I talk about all sorts of topics. And, and this one in particular is really near and dear to my heart, because as I mentioned, so many caregivers can easily get to the place of burnout because of the competing demands on their time. Um, and the stresses and burdens that can come with caregiving. But hopefully today uh, you can walk away with a few tips or resources on how to hopefully avoid burnout um, and uh, continue to do the role uh, of, of caregiving that you are doing uh, for your loved one, family member, or friend. And so when we talk about caregiver or care partner, I like to just put up all these different pictures because caregiving takes many different forms. It could be a spouse caring for another spouse. It could be an adult daughter or an adult son caring for an aging parent. Uh, we're seeing more grandchildren stepping up to help their grandparents. We also see long distance caregiving. You see that gentleman waving at his iPad. Uh, that's my kind of photo for a long distance caregiver. And that can be challenging, providing care from a distance. Uh, and then also at home and said, we call our care professionals caregivers as well. Uh, we refer to them that way at times too. So, you know, for the context of this presentation, I'll primarily talk about family caregivers, but I also know that there might be um, some professionals on the call too. So I'm going to talk a little bit about burnout from that perspective as well, because if you are caring as your profession, you can also reach burnout. And that's something we certainly want to avoid. So again, caregiving can take many forms. Uh, and I did just want to acknowledge that as we start out our presentation today. But what I think is super interesting is that caregiving also has different trajectories. We find the path that a caregiver takes can be, uh, can be differing and it can be, I usually see it fall into three categories, gradual, a crisis situation or short-term assistance. So when I mean gradual, it's kind of that caregiver creep. Um, you might've heard it referred to as that. It's over time, your caregiving role starts to take up more and more of your time and attention, uh, your energy. Uh, and we see this commonly in those caring for a loved one with a chronic condition, uh, especially in Alzheimer's or dementia caregiving, you kind of start out doing a little bit for your loved one. And then over time, it just becomes more and more as the disease progresses. So that's a, a gradual kind of pathway uh, for a caregiver. We also see crisis occur and overnight you become a caregiver. Some of you might 
on this call, identify with that. Maybe your loved one has a stroke or a fall or a heart attack and overnight um, they're in the hospital and all of a sudden you're going home and that person needs care and you are a caregiver uh, again overnight. And that can be really, really overwhelming, especially if you've never talked about, um, you know, the needs of your loved one, or you haven't planned ahead for caregiving needs um, that can be very, very overwhelming. And then we sometimes see a short-term caregiving role. Maybe your loved one has a hip replacement or a major surgery, and they need caregiving for a short period of time. And then once they've recovered or once they're through treatment, maybe for something like cancer uh, and they're in remission, then your, your caregiving role kind of goes away a little bit. So again, you can be a short-term caregiver as well. So again, I know this doesn't probably capture everyone's experience, but these are generally three kind of trajectories of caregiving. And it's easy to find yourself in burnout in any of these situations. And so whether you've gradually kind of come into this through that caregiver creep, uh, whether you have experienced a crisis and now you're caregiving or whether you're short-term caregiving, uh, again, you could reach that point of burnout, which is something we want to avoid. But we know family members often take on this majority of care. Uh, we often see the the spouse, if there is a spouse, they're usually the ones to step up. And then it falls usually to the adult children. They kind of come along and, and provide care and support. And most commonly, it's the adult daughter. We are seeing more males step into this caregiving role. Um, but often I'm interacting a lot with adult daughters who are caring for aging parents or caring for their in-laws. Um, and again, we we also see a differing um, in whether or not a caregiver feels like they have a choice in caregiving or they, they have varying degrees of kind of pressure in their caregiving role. Uh, so you might feel like, gosh, I'm the only one in my family that's stepping up to help. And that puts a lot of ac extra stress and pressure on yourself, or maybe you're the only one that lives nearby. And so naturally it falls to you um, to take on that role. And that can, again, add extra stress and strain. Uh, and so I think it's even more important to be in tune with how you're doing kind of on that scale of burnout. And we have a self-assessment that I'm going to share with you in just a little bit that might help you kind of walk through um, some questions to evaluate, am I to the point of burnout? Well, I think what's also putting added stress is we see, if you look at caregiving data, um, that the family caregiver pool is shrinking within families. Um, and what that means is people are having less children. Uh, and so there are more older people in families uh, than there are younger. And so uh, sometimes a family member might be caring for maybe their aging parent, but also an aging aunt or uncle or cousin. Uh, maybe that never had children. And so we see, um, again, less younger people in the family that are available to care for the older members. I sometimes use my family as an example. Um, my grandma is one of 12 children. My dad is one of six children. I'm one of four children. And right now I have one kiddo. Uh, so you can just kind of see that inverted pyramid. And so uh, likely there will be multiple older family members within our family unit that needs care and support. And there might be fewer people kind of in the younger generations to provide that care. And so uh, I could see that creating some stress and strain uh, and some kind of tension amongst family, uh, which is something that of course we see. But we, and again, when we look at the data, uh, family caregivers, you may have seen these numbers before, uh, but if you feel very alone and isolated in your caregiving role, which can happen very easily, I just want to remind you that you are one of millions of caregivers out there. There are lots of people that are going through very similar situations as you are. There's 53 million adults in the U.S. that serve as an informal caregiver. And over 16 million are providing care to a person living with dementia or another type of Alzheimer's or Alzheimer's disease or another type of dementia, pardon me. Uh, and the reason I kind of call that number out specifically is we often see dementia caregivers experiencing higher levels of stress, strain, and burden. Uh, and so if you are caring for someone with cognitive impairment or cognitive decline, again, even more so of a reason to be in tune with your burnout level, because 
you might likely have more stress and strain than the average caregiver. But also, I want you to know that the care you provide is valuable and it's really important. Uh, they put a dollar amount, so they added up if every informal caregiver got paid, it would equate to about $470 billion here in the U.S. Can you imagine if that was added to the government's budget? Oh my goodness, we would be uh, probably in a lot more debt <laughs> than we maybe already are. Uh, but really, this just goes to show the value of the care you provide. It's so, so important. Um, and I just want to take a moment to, to make sure I express my thanks and gratitude for all that you do uh, as a family caregiver. I know it's not always easy. What's also interesting is there is this, um, this theory of caregiving that kind of talks about um, the role of a caregiver and how it grows over time. Um, and so I'm going to use the example of a spouse or a daughter um, and how their caregiving role might grow over time. So in this first phase, caregiving might just occupy a small portion of the, of the person's time. Uh, you can see that turquoise bar there representing how much time they dedicate to caregiving. And then as they start to take on more roles and responsibilities, they start to slowly feel a shift from not just being only a spouse or daughter, but they're also starting to feel more like a caregiver. I will say a lot of people don't identify as a caregiver. They just feel like they're being a good daughter or a loving spouse. You know, I said my vows in sickness and in health and I'm sticking to it. Um, and so uh, often people don't identify as a caregiver, but in reality, they're taking on roles of a caregiver. And it can be very important to identify as a caregiver, because as we'll, as we'll talk through uh, in the later part of this presentation is there are resources and supports available like this wonderful teleconference um, series for caregivers. And so if you can identify as a caregiver, then it helps you to kind of um, open yourself up to perhaps more resources and support. So as you move through the various phases in phase two, at this point, it's maybe taking about a fourth of your time. You still feel uh, kind of maybe a balance between being a spouse and a caregiver, being a daughter and a caregiver. But then if you move into phase three, uh, you feel like more and more of your time is being dedicated to caregiving. You're starting to feel like your life is maybe going to be out of balance. Your, your home life, your family uh, is getting harder to manage along with your caregiving role. Maybe you're still working uh, at this phase. And so you're balancing work and caregiving in family life. Um, and that can be a lot to juggle. And you're really starting to feel torn between that role of a spouse and a caregiver or a daughter and a caregiver. And then you can get to phase four of this model where you feel like almost the majority of your time is spent caregiving. Maybe at this point you're having to give up work or cut back at work uh, to be a full-time caregiver and it's becoming very overwhelming. And at this point you feel more like a caregiver and hardly at all like a spouse or hardly at all like a daughter. Um, and that can be really, really hard. And, and we start to see burnout happening around phase three and four um, of kind of this journey of caregiving. And so we want to start to look into resources uh, to help alleviate some of this stress and burden. And I think what's hopeful about this model is phase five. Phase five, look, they got some of that balance back. And that's because in this phase, um, it's, it's after a caregiver has started to uh, engage in some of those resources that are available to them. Maybe they have some respite come into the home, or maybe they have chosen to move their loved one to a care community. Uh, and so that kind of helps to restore a little bit of balance to their life, helps them get back kind of that family role of spouse or daughter, uh, at least a little bit, makes them feel a little bit like they have that role back. Um, I know in the care we provide in the home care world, we, we send professional caregivers into the home to provide support. And I've had many uh, family caregivers tell me, oh, I can finally just be a daughter again and not have to be, you know, 
responsible for every single caregiving responsibility. Now that I have some help in the home, I feel like I can actually sit down with my mom and have a cup of tea instead of going over and rushing around to do a million different things. Um, so again, if you're feeling like, oh, I'm in that phase of burnout, I, I just can't imagine um, how long this is sustainable. Well, this is a good point in time for you to start looking into the resources that are out there to help you maybe find a little bit of that balance again. And then if you're a professional on the call, again, I, I told, told you at the beginning, I touch a little bit on the professional side of things. Sometimes professionals kind of experience the reverse of those phases. Uh, they start out as like a, a caregiver and that's their professional role. But as they get to know the family, spend time with them or the person that they're caring for, sometimes they begin to feel like family. They become very invested in the life of the person that they're caring for, even in uh, a professional setting. Uh, and sometimes then that can lead to um, some potential burnout uh, because you're um, really invested, you're spending a lot of time and energy. And so again, it's interesting to think about this kind of in the reverse. Uh, and again, at home and said, we often hear people say, oh, our, our professional caregiver, they really feel like family. They feel like part of the family. Uh, and so if you are a professional in the caregiving role, you still want to keep in mind um, some of the elements of self-care that we're going to talk through later um, so that you, again, can avoid burnout even in the professional setting. Especially during COVID, we saw a lot of professionals experience that burnout um, uh, from that professional role. And when we look at the impacts of family caregiving, uh, we kind of see it fall into a couple of buckets. Uh, we find that there's emotional stress, uh, there's physical demands, there's financial strains, but I love to end on a positive note because there's also a sense of purpose that caregiving can provide. And so I don't want my entire presentation to seem doom and gloom. You're reaching burnout. I do want to focus on those things that help make caregivers resilient in their role. Uh, and so we're going to touch on each of these categories now. So the emotional impact that we see in family caregivers is we often see chronic stress. Um, and if you think about, um, if you think about that, that can lead to higher rates of anxiety and depression. And when we look at caregiving data compared to the general population, we do see higher rates of anxiety and depression. Uh, and so if you're starting to feel uh, any of those symptoms, it's important that you bring those up to your healthcare provider. Um, because again, chronic stress um, can lead to additional health issues. Uh, we know if there's elevated levels of uh, those stress hormones within the body, it can start to kind of physically manifest, which is something we don't, we don't want. Um, and, you know, if anxiety and depression go untreated, it can lead to, again, um, some, some burnout. And we want family caregivers to be able to continue caregiving for their loved one as long as possible. So if we can address these things uh, earlier on, um, hopefully we can avoid that burnout later. We also see a lot of mixed emotions. You as a family caregiver, even in one day or in one hour, you might experience this roller coaster of emotions, this range of emotions, things like uncertainty. You're you're worried about the future. Uh, you might have a sense of helplessness, like, like there is um, nothing more you can do, or it feels very overwhelming. Uh, you might also have some anger or frustration. Uh, maybe it's around the circumstance. Maybe it's uh, some resentment towards the person you're caring for because you didn't think life was going to end up like this. Uh, and then you feel guilt for feeling all of those emotions. Um, and so I want to just let you know that uh, it's okay to feel those feelings and not to let the guilt uh, overtake uh, your entire experience because you are doing the best with the resources that you have. And hopefully again, by educating yourself, attending uh, events like this, you can start to learn about things that can maybe help you along your journey, resources, supports. Um, and so 
um, hopefully it can help you with some of those emotions. But again, on the positive side of things, you might feel satisfaction or accomplishment uh, in your caregiving role. You might also feel that love and tenderness towards the person you're caring for. A lot of times I hear family caregivers say, well, my mom or dad raised me or my aunt really invested in me growing up and, and this is my opportunity to give back. Um, and so again, you might have that emotional roller coaster and it's, it can be helpful to um, find healthy outlets for these emotions. And we're going to talk more about that later on. Now, when we look at the physical impact of caregiving, we find, again, if you look at caregiving data, that the more hours of care that a caregiver provides, the higher physical strain they often have. Um, and that could be because they're having to physically help their loved one in and out of the chair. Um, they might have... Um, you know, they might have less sleep in their life because of the caregiving role. Maybe it's due to the stress. Maybe it's due to the individual getting up throughout the night. But anyway, we see the more hours of care that you provide as a caregiver, the more likely you're, ex you're going to experience perhaps some physical strain. Um, and also this might be because often caregivers put their own health on the back burner. They make sure their loved one or their family member gets to every doctor's appointment, takes every medication. Uh, they're very diligent about the, the healthcare of the person that they're supporting. And then they forget to go to their own doctor's appointment or take their own medication. And we see that lead to an increase in chronic conditions. So we see more things like diabetes, hypertension, um, those kinds of things within the caregiving population, again, because they're putting their health on the back burner, which was something we don't want you to do. So this might be, if you're on the call, this might be uh, your reminder to schedule your annual physical to get to your next doctor's appointment, make that a priority uh, because that's the last thing we want to see um, is, you know, exhaustion and fatigue and, and uh, illness get to a point where you can no longer care for your loved one. Because what happens if you're hospitalized? Who's going to care for the person you're caring for? Um, and again, we see that exhaustion and fatigue. It's very common. Um, I'm a new mom and uh, my little guy has an ear infection right now. So I'm going on some fumes in terms of sleep right now. So I physically can relate to this uh, bullet point of fatigue and exhaustion. And when you're not sleeping, it can really impact your mood, uh, your mental capacity. Uh, I'm living that right now. So um, anyway, I just, I feel, I feel those caregivers out there that, that experience that. And then something else that can happen is this can diminish our immune response. So we can get sick more easily. I know hopefully we're coming out of cold and flu season as we head into spring. Um, but if your immune system is down uh, because of things like your chronic fatigue and exhaustion, your stress, then you're more susceptible to, uh, to illness as well. And that's something that we, we definitely want to avoid if possible. And so you might start to see physical signs of distress. Um, again, that sleep, you might also start to see it physically manifest in muscle pain. I know when I'm stressed, I tend to get uh, tightness in my neck and shoulders. Um, you might start to have headaches. You might start to also have dis digestive issues, some gut health issues, and you might also see some weight gain or loss. So um, those just might be some physical cues um, that you yourself need to seek some um, healthcare attention of your own. We also see financial impact. Um, on average, 26% of family caregivers' income uh, is dedicated to their role as a caregiver. And uh, on average, if, again, if you look at caregiving data, that's just over $7,000 annually. So what this can do is prevent you from your own retirement savings. Uh, you can have stress related to the financial burden, stressed about making ends meet, those kinds of things. And if you're a long distance caregiver, we often see more financial burden for those individuals, maybe because they're having to pay for care because they're not physically present to provide it. Maybe it's additional travel expense to go visit and check in regularly on the person that you're caring for long distance. Um, so we do see that. We also see workplace impacts. Uh, you might start to have attendance issues. You might have to pass up a promotion or taking on additional responsibilities at work that could impact your earning level uh, because of your role as a caregiver. 
or you might have to cut back on your hours or exit the workforce entirely. Uh, and then that also can impact, again, your savings, your retirement planning. And so, um, you know, the more you can start to think about these things and perhaps try to tap into uh, various resources uh, earlier on in your caregiving journey, hopefully um, you won't see as a big of a financial impact. Um, and what I think is really interesting right now at the federal level, um, there are a few, um, and even maybe, I know in my state, there is even um, some state level uh, tax credits that have been proposed. They're not um, law yet, but they've been proposed for family caregivers to help with some of these expenses. So I hope that these tax credits eventually pass uh, because again, caregivers are paying a lot out of pocket um, and it is impacting financially. But as I mentioned, I didn't want to be all doom and gloom because um, in the National Alliance for Caregiving's study, Caregiving in the U.S., they asked caregivers about their sense of purpose. Um, so it was kind of a, how much do you agree or disagree with this statement of my caregiving role gives me a sense of purpose or meaning in my life? And over half agreed or strongly agreed that it did provide a sense of purpose. Uh, and I think that that is significant to mention because uh, again, this caregiving role can be hard, but sometimes if we can tap into those more positive elements of the caregiving role, that's one way we can hopefully prevent some of that burnout from occurring. So I hope that, um, you know, if you do feel that sense of purpose um, in your role as a caregiver, that that helps to bring some positivity to this journey of caregiving. And if you if you're on that strongly disagree or disagree side of things, or you're kind of stuck in that middle, like, I don't really know if this gives me a sense of purpose. That's okay. That is okay. Um, and maybe you want to do a little soul searching to see if you can um, find the positive elements of caregiving um, to help you along that journey. Um, or it's okay too to, to, to not do that. I just, again, want to acknowledge that if you don't have that sense of purpose, you're not doing something wrong. It's okay. But I mentioned a self-assessment. Uh, and so you can kind of go through uh, and ask yourself these questions. Uh, and, you know, the more yeses, that you find yourself answering to these questions, the more you might be at risk for burning out. Um, and so then you can start to maybe identify areas that you could start to address or find support and resources um, to help come alongside you in your journey of caregiving. Um, and I'm going to go through um, some areas that hopefully, um, or some kind of elements of, of this that hopefully you can tap into to reduce burden. Um, and I did provide a PDF of these slides that will be sent to you uh, as a participant. So if, uh, if don't feel like you have to write all these questions down, I'm not going to go through all of them. Uh, but again, this could be something you could, you could go through maybe on a monthly basis or even weekly basis, if that's helpful to you. Um, but you know, these kinds of questions, again, can help you to start to identify potential areas of your caregiving journey or role where maybe some support would be helpful, again, to help prevent burnout. So this kind of leads into the topic of self-care. And I feel like this term gets overused or kind of glossed over. Uh, one of my colleagues in the field, she said, we should call it survival care instead of self-care because... <laughs> Really, you do need to take care of yourself to survive this journey, to again, be able to care over time for your loved one, because we often see this is a, this is a marathon. It's not a sprint. Uh, and so it's really important at all phases in your caregiving journey to focus on caring for yourself and to balance your needs with the needs of the person that you're caring for. And sometimes you might feel like that's absolutely impossible. And I want to recognize that, but Again, it's so important for you to say, okay, it feels impossible, but what is maybe one thing I could do for myself today that's going to sustain me to make it to tomorrow? So you might not have to think about this whole self-care as part of your entire journey. It can just be, how am I going to do one thing for me today to get me through to tomorrow? But again, 
we see the negative consequences of neglecting self-care or the survival care uh, that can lead to physical, mental, emotional health issues for the caregiver. And so again, we want to avoid that. And in some really extreme situations, uh, we see the caregiver being hospitalized um, or even passing away before the person that they're caring for. And I don't want that for anyone. Um, And so we're going to go through some self-care approaches in these various categories. And some might seem like no brainers or yeah, yeah, I've heard that before, but sometimes we need reminders uh, and maybe you'll take away one or two new nuggets of information on maybe how you can incorporate a little bit of self-care uh, in your day-to-day life. So um, we're going to talk through health and wellness, altruism and activism, reminiscing, legacy building, your social support network, uh, information exchange, organization organization and planning, and then spirituality. So we're going to walk through each of these. So when it comes to health and wellness, I've already kind of uh, talked a lot about how important our health is as a caregiver. And again, there's that fine line of balancing your own needs with the person that you're caring for. But if you can find little ways to incorporate things into your life, like exercise, meditation, yoga, walking, even in just small increments of time, Maybe it's just going for a walk around the block when you, every day when you go out to get the mail. Uh, it might feel like just five or 10 minutes of your time, but getting outside in nature can be really good for your health and wellness. Getting a little blood pumping uh, can be good. So it doesn't have to be, you know, finding a yoga class and attending it. It could be finding a five minute stretching video on YouTube uh, and doing a little bit Uh, for yourself, especially if you're, you know, experiencing that physical strain, the aches and pains of caregiving, maybe some of that stretching, you know, a little Tai Chi, a little stretching can be really um, helpful in sustaining you as a caregiver, you know, making sure that you're eating and hydrating, uh, again, really, really important, uh, because again, we don't want to see your physical health um, decline to such that, you're no longer available to care for your loved one. Uh, And also stress management and relaxation. And again, that that doesn't have to look like going out and getting a massage, which would be lovely and wonderful, but it could be just taking three deep breaths before you walk into a challenging caregiving situation. Those three deep breaths can help to calm your nervous system, help to lower those cortisone stress levels in your body and help you perhaps have a little more peace of mind, a clarity of mind walking into a really tough situation. So again, um, I don't want you to feel overwhelmed by, oh, I have to go on a diet and I have to start exercising five days a week not what I'm saying here. Just find little ways um, to incorporate some of this into your day-to-day life. And even if it's, hey, I just want to eat one more serving of a vegetable or one more piece of fruit in my day, that's a great place to start. Um, And so again, it doesn't have to be monumental steps. It can be small things. Altruism and activism, um, in this study that I keep referencing at the bottom of these slides, they talked about how this can be of benefit to family caregivers. You know, the sense of giving back can lessen the strain and burden of caregiving. Also being able to share your experience with others is so helpful. If you're not in a support group of some sort, um, perhaps that's something you could seek out. There's a lot of disease specific support groups. So whether, uh, I know there's a lot for the forms of dementia, which, um, like Alzheimer's, uh, frontal temporal degeneration, Lewy body dementia, there's different support groups for those various types of caregiving, but even maybe you're managing diabetes in your loved one. Well, go to the American Diabetes website and see if there's a support group or some sort of Facebook page you can follow uh, to glean information from other caregivers that are going through the journey. Maybe you follow a blog of a family caregiver or again, those online forums. I know Facebook has so many of them. Uh, I I love to follow those groups and see all the sharing of ideas that happen uh, within that Facebook group. And sometimes that's nice because you might not have the time to commit to a monthly or weekly support group, but kind of dropping in to get those nuggets of of encouragement and support can be really helpful. You might also 
find volunteering and engaging in community service might be uh, a way to kind of lift your spirits. And you might think, well, I don't have time for that. <laughs> and that's perfectly fine. Uh, but there's ways that maybe within the, um, again, chronic condition or disease state that you are caregiving for, again, maybe it's a type of dementia, uh, diabetes, uh, arthritis, something of that sort. Maybe there is some advocacy that you can engage in uh, from the comfort of your home. Uh, maybe it's something like for these tax credits, writing your senator or your local congressman and saying, I'm a family caregiver, sharing your story and saying, you know, this tax credit that you, that is proposed would be so helpful to me. And this is why, and that might be an email you can write, uh, but that sense of action and purpose uh, can be really um, encouraging and, and can provide hope, especially in sometimes hopeless situations, if you can kind of pay it forward and also participating in clinical trials or research. Um, we often talk about how, you know, the treatments and cures for various diseases often, you know, they start in the clinical trials, they, every, you know, drug has to go through that process and they need participants. So it's perhaps engaging in that as well, that can provide that sense of purpose and meaning. And sometimes it can also give you access to healthcare that you might not otherwise uh, receive again through those clinical trial experiences. We also see reminiscing and legacy building as a unique way to help provide moments of, of respite and relief during stressful times, uh, you know, things like looking through photographs and sharing memories. It can be therapeutic, not only for you, but for the person you're caring for. And sometimes it can create a positive experience together. You know, sometimes um, there can be just a series of one thing after another, after another, and it can feel so daunting and burdensome. And you might, you might find yourself, um, you know, looking for maybe a positive, happy, joyful experience with your loved one. And so perhaps going back through old photos or sharing memories could spark some of those feelings of, uh, of joy or uh, positivity that could help, again, just get you to that next moment of your caregiving journey or get you to your next day. Maybe you create a, a scrapbook or a photo album, um, or maybe you kind of jot down some, some memories for future generations. Um, again, those can be kind of therapeutic ways to connect with your loved one. And also it can allow for the processing of anticipatory grief, which that's kind of a fancy term, but what that means is uh, often we find caregivers grieving their loved one, even while they're still alive. They're anticipating um, uh, grief that might be coming at the end of their illness, or perhaps in, in a dementia or Alzheimer's diagnosis, you're watching your loved one's memory fade away. You're watching their personality change and you're grieving. Uh, and so sometimes looking through these photos and sharing memories can be a way to help you process the grief, remind you um, of who that person was before the disease took hold um, and can help you process that grief. But it is hard. It's really hard to grieve while you're still caregiving, but it's so common. Know that you're not alone. Um, and um, there is another term for this. And oh my goodness, it's escaping me right now. But anticipatory grief has another term. Hopefully it'll come to me. Um, but there's even, I, I did um, a live chat with somebody um, on this topic. And so there are some resources out there that can share even more on this topic of, oh, ambiguous loss. I knew it would come to me. Ambiguous loss. That's another term for this that you could Google uh, and just find some resources and support if you find yourself grieving along your caregiving journey. Also, your social support network is really, really important. And you might um, find yourself, you know, drawing on the support from others to reduce uh, your isolation, your loneliness. Uh, and also, it can help to normalize the experience of caregiving. Um, you know, sometimes you might, again, feel so alone in your caregiving journey. But as you start to connect with others, with other caregivers, again, in those support groups or through blogging, uh, you can share your success and your failures. You can learn from one another. Also, um, developing a healthy support system for not only the, the kind of physical task-based care that you're providing, that's helpful. So maybe it's hiring home care um, or maybe it's um, 
utilizing an adult day center uh, to provide you some respite or some extra help, but also think about the support for you as the caregiver, you yourself. How can you find people who are going to contribute to your self-esteem, who will listen to you, who will care for you as well? Um, so sometimes when you think about your support network, you might start to jot down all the people that can maybe help uh, the person you're caring for but also think a little bit broader. Who can help you? Maybe it's somebody that provides a weekly meal uh, for you. Or if you are that sandwich generation caregiver with kiddos at home, maybe it's uh, some of the kids, friends, parents kind of help out with getting um, Johnny to soccer practice. Or maybe it's just a, a good friend who brings over a cup of coffee and listens. Um, or maybe it's a relative that provides you some respite, some time away while you um, get a chance to recharge or take care of some of your own needs. So um, that can be helpful. And then also um, professional counseling services can be uh, a really helpful benefit um, to those that are wanting to process some of these emotions of caregiving. Um, and it can be especially helpful if you can find a, a counselor or a therapist that has worked with family caregivers before. Um, but I mean, I, I go to counseling and therapy and it's really helpful for me just to sometimes have a, a non-judgmental third party removed from the situation that can help provide some perspective and help you reflect on perhaps ways that you can negotiate this caregiving role so that you can find some pockets of time for your own self-care or survival care. So again, create that social support network for you and for your loved ones. So don't, don't just think about it for the person you're caring for that care recipient. Think about it for you as well. Also, information gathering can be really helpful. So I've been talking about some of these support services, and I wish I could hand you a, you know, a list and say, here, this is all the support resources that exist, but things vary from state to state, from city to city, uh, from urban to rural. Uh, and so it is important to look into what's available in your community. And maybe it's starting with your local area agency on aging, of which I have their website on one of the last slides. So don't need to jot that down right away. But you know, what resources can you tap into? And maybe also you, you look into how could I simplify my care routine? Uh, sometimes we, we get into routine and we don't even know why we do things the way we do things. Maybe it's because that's the way the care recipient wants it done, or that's the way you've always done it. But maybe try to look at it through a fresh lens. Do we have to do things this way? Um, it takes a lot longer, uh, or maybe we don't have to do this activity every day. Maybe we can adjust every other day. Um, and sometimes it can be hard to negotiate that with the person you're caring for. Um, I have a podcast and I actually had a conversation about boundaries with um, um, an expert kind of on the topic on my podcast. And it was really interesting. She talked about how, you know, you're changing a lot of your life as a caregiver to accommodate caring for the person you're supporting. Um, and so, you know, it's okay to have a conversation about how can that care recipient adjust their expectations or adjust their routine to accommodate you as the caregiver. It's a hard conversation to have, but it can be empowering for you as a caregiver. How can I negotiate the situation so that I'm not overextending myself and we're coming to kind of a mutual place um, of balance and understanding? So um, that might be a conversation that you want to have. And I'm going to share more about my podcast at the end. And so you can go seek out that specific episode uh, and listen to it. Uh, but also look into those community supports, you know, home care, like we provide at home instead, uh, adult day programs. Sometimes communities also have volunteer support programs for lawn care or handyman services. Um, but also look into possible future care needs and look into it before you really ever need it. Because again, even on your caregiving journey, you might experience a crisis and overnight you might need home care or overnight you might need to find a rehab facility. And if you spent a little bit of time doing some advanced research on that, knowing your options, knowing what's available, 
then it can make it a little less stressful. It'll always be stressful, but a little less stressful in that moment and help you make probably a better decision in that moment because you know more about your options. Uh, And this might be also something you could outsource to a a long distance family member. Hey, sister who lives in uh, five states over, could you do some research on home care that's available in our area? That would really help me out. Um, That way, if we need it for mom down the road, we know some of our options. So again, planning for the future. And that organization and planning, it can provide a sense of control uh, in sometimes what can feel like a very chaotic and um, uh, an environment of which you don't have a lot of control. And so sometimes it's helpful to focus on those things that we can control. Um, And sometimes when it comes to planning and being organized, you can do that. And so prioritizing needs, um, scheduling. Sometimes you physically need to schedule your own self-care, you know, not only those doctor's appointments, but scheduling in a little bit of time for yourself. Uh, And then this can help you identify when outside resources might be necessary, like respite, um, having some family or friends come in, having a home care provider, utilizing those adult day centers. But it could also maybe help you assess can I use some of those convenience services that are out there like grocery store delivery? Or can we look at a mail order pharmacy so I don't have to run out and get my loved one's pills uh, every couple of weeks? Or can I outsource my lawn care or snow removal to a family member or uh, a a local company? Uh, And so, you know, as you start to organize and plan, you can look into how can I tap into some of these support uh, options for me? And then a lot of times I hear caregivers talk about their spirituality and their faith as a a source of support for them, a a well they can draw from when they're feeling at a place of perhaps burnout and those sorts of things. So so drawing on your faith, spirituality, religion as that source of strength, Uh, maybe it's engaging in prayer if that's something that uh, is important to you or meditation, uh, just quieting your mind, clearing your head. Uh, Spending time in nature can be very uh, uplifting from a spiritual perspective for some people. Uh, And a lot of times faith communities, they have supports and resources. So reaching out, maybe they have a volunteer that can take your loved one to the faith service on the weekend, or or that it could come sit with your loved one while you get to go to the faith service, uh, things of that sort. Um, And for the person you're caring for, if faith is important to them, um, that can be a great way for you to connect with them. Maybe it's listening to um, spiritual or faith-based music or doing some of the rituals of your faith practice. Um, And again, um, connecting in that unique way. Um, And so again, if spirituality is something that's important to you, don't forget that that is a source of support as well. So I know I covered a lot and I do want to open it up for some question and discussion, but I do, again, want to encourage you to start small. You know, what is one thing you could do this week to avoid burnout? And maybe it's just walking through that assessment and starting to evaluate areas. Uh, Maybe it's your goal is to get on one 15 minute walk this week out in nature uh, to clear your mind. Um, Start small. Don't try to tackle it all at once. That's going to be overwhelming. It's probably going to get you to burn out faster. And that's the last thing that I want. Um, And then also identify, you know, what resources in your community have you yet to tap into and start to do some of that research and planning. And start to evaluate your support system. You know, how could you expand that support system? Again, it might not be directly related to the care of the person you're caring for, but maybe it's someone to support you or to help um, with just aspects of family life, um, like helping out with the, the children or that sort of thing. So again, start small. Don't try to eat the elephant in one bite, as they say, uh, you know, I have to eat the elephant one bite at a time um, and and just start to find ways to uh, take care of yourself so that you hopefully can avoid that burnout and build that resilience within yourself. So here are some of the resources um, that I've been mentioning. Um, At Home Instead's website, we have great care resources uh, that you can find there. You can also do a zip code search to find home care. Uh, We have over 650 locations in the U.S. So wherever you or the person you're caring for is, we likely have a Home Instead there. Also, I mentioned your area agency on aging. That is a great place to start 
for community support and resources. They have a wealth of information and knowledge and every county in the US has a area agency on aging. So you can go to that website, type in the zip code and find the one near you. Uh, there's some also great um, caregiving organizations out there, the National Alliance for Caregiving. They do a lot of advocacy. Uh, so again, if you wanted to get more involved in advocacy, share your story, um, that organization along with Caregiver Action Network great organizations to tap into. At the very least, you could like, like them or follow them on social media and get some nuggets of information that way. And then I wanted to provide some support group information. I mentioned, you know, disease specific support groups. These happen to be, um, you know, kind of neurocognitive related, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, Lewy body, frontal to temporal degeneration. Um, but again, Often they have a kind of a helpline. So you could call in a kind of crisis or a moment of, of an overwhelming feeling or to get connected to some of their resources. But often they also have support groups that can be really helpful to tap into. Uh, and then Hilarity for Charity is a great organization. Um, I'm on their care advisory board. They have great support groups that are all virtual. They also have uh, some just additional resources. And they also bring some laughter and levity. Uh, it's founded by the actor Seth Rogen and his wife Lauren Miller Rogen. Uh, so they bring some comedy um, to the topic because sometimes if you don't laugh, you're going to cry. <laughs> I know um, that can be kind of another way to just in the moment uh, find something to laugh about or um, just bring a little levity to the situation that can that can help. Um, and then I mentioned oh, my podcast caregiver chats. Um, so you can search for it on your favorite caregiving app or on Spotify, Apple, um, and you can, you can like, and subscribe to the podcast. I post a new episode, uh, twice a month. Um, so well, some of the recent episodes I've done is focusing on the positives in caregiving. So if you really wanted to tap into that, um, I also talk about, um, things that are really challenging, like the topic of driving, um, I also recently did one on hearing loss. I have ones coming up on fall prevention and the power of music, but also the episode that I did on the boundaries, I'm just going to look on my phone super quick. Of course, I have it, um, my podcast saved on uh, my own phone uh, so that I can quickly uh, reference it. But the episode that I did on boundaries. I just, again, really liked that conversation and would encourage you to go out and listen to it. It was episode 12. Um, it was with Consuela Marshall, uh, who is, um, uh, an occupational therapist. She's worked with caregivers for years. So we talked a lot about making boundaries easier for caregivers. So would encourage you to check that out as well. And with that, I'll open it up for some questions. Uh, and you can also reach out to me, find me on LinkedIn uh, if you would like. Um, I'm always happy to, to chat, provide resources and so forth. So I'm going to stop sharing and turn it back over uh, for any questions that folks might have. Lakeland, you did a beautiful job. I'm so sorry I was late. My calendar set up, it started at nine. And no worries. I, there were probably a couple <laughs> other people who thought it started an hour later too, because I saw some folks come in late. Um, but I want you all to know that we will be sending a link to the podcast with the resources and the post-session questionnaire. And Lakeland, you do a beautiful presentation. It's Thank very you. thorough, very understandable, you know, great bullets. And I want to thank you so much for your time and work on that. And we have uh, some questions, some chats. Let's see, Tina, you want to go ahead? Oh, sorry. I just was applauding the uh, presentation. I'm sorry. I didn't raise my hand. I was just applauding. I'm so sorry. No worries. No worries. We have some chats here. And then we're going to look at those. Yeah, it looks like Shelly, um, she says she's frustrated. She wants her sister to help more. She lives near her mom, uh, but it looks like her sister's maybe an hour away. And so that's always hard. I know challenging family dynamics can really add to that stress and burden. And if you are the primary caregiver, it can feel like the weight of the world's on your shoulders. Um, and so, and, and Shelly, you don't have to answer this. So these are some rhetorical questions, but feel free if you want, if you want to answer it, but sometimes you, as a caregiver, a lot of times people will say, well, let me know how I can help. And you, a lot of times as a caregiver, you're like, oh, okay, I'll let you know. 
But what you might want to do, Shelly, is write down a few things that you do want help with or that would be helpful to you. So then the next time somebody offers that, you can say, actually, I'm so glad you offered. I would love your help with X, Y, or Z. Or for your sister specifically, maybe you need to ask her for something very specific. Instead of just saying, sister, I wish you would help more. You could say, you know, what would be really helpful to me, sister, is mom has a, a doctor's appointment um, you know, every other Tuesday. Um, and if you could come in once a month and take her to that, so I don't have to go every time, that would be really helpful. Or sister, I have my own doctor's appointment that I need to get to or hair appointment or insert whatever you want to do for yourself. Um, would you be willing to come down this Saturday, uh, and be with mom from eight to five, uh, so that I can get some things done for me? Um, cause sometimes again, you don't, you want to help and you just kind of throw it, the statement out there. Um, and you just want to know, tell me exactly what I, what I need to do to help. Um, and especially if you have, um, a male in your family, I don't mean to bash men by any means, but sometimes men, you just need to be very direct on what you need. So if you have a brother, um, that you want to help with something, you might just have to say to him, you know what? The finances are getting very overwhelming to me. Is that something that you could take on uh, and do for us? Or, um, you know, mom's lawn is getting harder to maintain. Would you um, come over and mow every other week? That would be super helpful to me. Um, so again, sometimes it's, it's being very direct in your ask um, and letting them know how it would help you as the caregiver too. Um, because it, it can be really frustrating and overwhelming to be the only person involved in the care. Um, and, and also you might have to ask over and over again. It might not be something um, that like, it's not maybe a conversation that you tackle one and done. It might be, hey, you know, last month that was so great that you came over. Could you come back again on this date? And and sometimes it can be really hard to let go of that frustration and guilt and accept the fact that you as the primary caregiver might need to initiate this every time. You know, you wish that your sister would just naturally step up, um, but you might just need to accept that she um, maybe isn't helping out as much as you'd like, but how can you have a conversation with her, talk with her about ways she can help. And maybe there's a capacity issue on her end too. Maybe a physical, financial, time capacity um, thing for her too. And so uh, again, might just be opening up for discussion. Um, and some extreme cases, having a mediator, have a, uh, you have a family meeting, bring in a mediator and have them help the family have a discussion about maybe alleviating the primary caregiver of, of some of the, the duties and responsibilities. So um, that, that could be just one approach you could take Shelly, but I just, I know many family caregivers struggle with getting loved ones um, to, to chip in with some of the care responsibilities and needs. Right, so we have right. two more um, chats and yeah. we are, we have like, I, I need two minutes Yes. So, oh, sorry. Okay. Can we, can we respond to those um, yes. quickly? Thank you. Yeah. Um, Zoom meetings for caregivers. Yes. I know that. Um, so Hilarity for Charity, that HFC organization, they have drop-in caregiver cafes, I think they call it, where they host like a Zoom and you can just drop in. You don't have to commit to um, a regular um ongoing support group session. So there those do exist out there. Um, and then how many caregivers spend 24 seven with their loved ones like you do, Christine? And that can be so overwhelming. And I'm sure there's others on the call that, that are in that role. Um, and so, you know, for, for individuals like you starting to look into those resources that could provide you with respite could be really helpful. Maybe there's an adult day program, maybe a paid respite service like home instead or a volunteer respite service that you could start to look into so that you could just get a few hours a week or a day back to yourself. So, um, I know that you're not alone. There are many, many people that are, that are providing around the clock care and it can be very overwhelming. So thank you all for your questions, Evelyn. I know you need a few minutes, so I'll pass it back to you. Thank you. Um, I just want to say that you've done a beautiful job and I really appreciate, you know, your time and energy on this. You're a wonderful presenter. 
I also would like to say that there is online support at the Alzheimer's Dot organization. They have support groups listed on their um, on their website, but they also have something called alzheimersconnected.org, which is a chat room. And if you need to vent, that's a good place to do it. A chat room is a good place to do it because you're probably not the only one that's in the mood to vent some days. Mm. So with that, you know, I want people to know that we will be sending out the resources with the post-session questionnaire. If you're not registered, with our uh, customer service representative, please give her a call at 866-390-6491, 866-390-6491. And then you will get the post-session questionnaire. And once you get that, you will also get the monthly calendar. It's that little you know, bonus thing that the infomercials always do. Um, we hope you fill out the questionnaire and help us improve our sessions. And I've got, there are a bunch of sessions coming up in April. Um, you will get the calendar, but it looks like a really good lineup of um, things that we haven't heard recently. And I think you probably would be very interested in. And Minerva, did you have anything you wanted to add? Uh, yes, Mia Culpa. So I'm the one that messes up. Um, the, sesh, the link to the recording will be included together with the slides. And I should have that up by this afternoon. So if you're registered, you'll receive the link and the slides. If you didn't register, just give me a call at 866-390-6491. I'd be more than happy to send you the link as well. Thank you, Minerva. You're the best. You're so helpful always. And again, Lakeland, thank you so much. And thank all the caregivers for what you do and for participating today. We always appreciate your questions, your comments, your help, because we have learned so much um, from programs. And so we have a question about programming at 11 Central Time. Uh, Minerva, I'm going to leave that one for you. Yes, there was an error message and I did send out an email to everyone as quickly as that was noticed. So you would have the link to connect. Yeah, and you don't need to just it. watch the slides. You can also watch the podcast and she's yes. going to get it up really fast. And it'll be just like this, only um, online. Well, this was online. Anyway, thank you all so much. And thanks to the WellMed Charitable Foundation for all the support they give caregivers time after time, day after day, and for that treasure trove of podcasts at www.caregivertelecconnection.org. And with that, um, we will see you soon, hopefully. And thank you so much for joining us. We're um, going to leave the meeting now. You'll hear a recording to stop or you'll hear a 